and welcome to another episode of Julia Herdman History, where I take an in-depth look at the lesser-known people and events of history. Today, I'm delving into the origins of one of England's oldest traditional events, Guy Fawkes Night. As the clocks go back, and the nights draw in, children in Britain prepare for bonfire night. The most important aspect of this night of flames and fireworks is the effigy of Guy Fawkes. The effigy, simply known as Guy, is usually made by stuffing a pair of old trousers and a worn-out shirt with newspaper and dry autumn leaves. Then making a head from a paper bag. When I was a kid, this ragged guy would be perched in an old pram or pusher and parked on a street corner by kids who would call out. A penny for the guy. This was a form of begging done by poor kids to get money to buy fireworks for the upcoming night of celebrations. Bangers and jumping jack flashes could be bought with a fistful of pennies in those days from the local paper shop. Come nightfall on the 5th of November, the guy would be placed on the top of the bonfire, usually in the back garden. Now, the celebrations are less personal. Most people go to a community bonfire or an organized fireworks display, if they do anything at all. But, in the good old days, dads would come home from work with a box of standard fireworks. Guy would be put on top of the pile of garden waste and collected rubbish. The bonfire would be lit, and the festivities would begin with the chant, Remember, remember the 5th of November, gunpowder treason and plot. As children we loved the excitement, the fireworks, the toffee apples and the bonfire baked potatoes that went with this traditional annual event. Today, the celebration is less popular. The garden bonfire and the homemade guy have been replaced by organized firework displays. England is now a more mixed society and many people know little of our country's heritage and history. And in this tolerant age, people ask, why do we celebrate burning poor old Guy Fawkes on top of a bonfire? Who was he, and what did he do to deserve such a fate? So, let's have a look at the gunpowder plot. And the men and women involved in this sinister Catholic conspiracy. Designed to kill the entire royal family. All the members of the House of Commons and all the members of the House of Lords. The idea behind the gunpowder plot was a massive act of terrorist that would obliterate the Protestant King James I, his family, and his parliament, in a gigantic fiery inferno. According to modern physicists, the explosion planned by Guy Fawkes and his accomplices, would have devastated all of central London if they had succeeded. An area, as big as a couple of square miles, would have been razed to the ground. As well as destroying the Houses of Parliament. The blast that would have resulted from the 5,500 pounds of gunpowder. He and his fellow conspirators had packed away in the cellars under the Parliament building. Would also have taken Westminster Abbey with it. The radicalization of Guy Fawkes, Robert Catesby, John, and Christopher Wright, Robert, and Thomas Winter, Thomas Percy, Robert Keyes, Thomas Bates, John Grant, Ambrose Rookwood, Sir Everard Digby and Francis Tresham began in 1570. When Pope Pius V, excommunicated Elizabeth I, thus freeing her subjects to depose her. This put all English Catholics under suspicion of being traitors. Then came the 1572, St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre in Paris. The day when thousands of French Protestants were slaughtered in the streets by the henchmen of Catherine de' Medici and by Roman Catholic nobles. The atrocities carried out by Spanish troops in the Netherlands. And the failed invasion of England by the Spanish Armada in 1588. All added to the feeling that England and the new Protestant faith were under serious attack from the forces supporting the Pope and Catholicism. The anti-Protestant events taking place on the continent made English Protestants naturally fearful. It seemed there was an international Catholic empire intent on evil just across the water. Worse still, they knew that this evil empire had supporters living and working against them in England. Consequently, the state made every effort to stamp out this Catholic fifth column.
When Elizabeth died and James became King of England and Scotland, Catholics began to hope that their persecution would end. James's attitude towards Catholics was more moderate than that of his predecessor, perhaps even tolerant. He swore that he would not persecute any that would be quiet and give an outward obedience to the law, and believed that exile was a better solution than capital punishment. Some Catholics believed that the martyrdom of James's mother, Mary, Queen of Scots, would encourage James to convert to the Catholic faith, and the Catholic houses of Europe may also have shared that hope. However, following his accession James made no move to support the English Catholics. Two Jesuit priests therefore decided to take matters into their own hands. In what became known as the Biplot, William Watson and William Clark planned to kidnap James and hold him in the Tower of London until he agreed to be more tolerant towards Catholics. England's spymaster, Lord Robert Cecil received news of the plot from several sources and took steps to subvert it. At the same time Lord Cobham, Lord Grader Wilton, Griffin Markham and Sir Walter Orley hatched, what became known as the main plot. This scheme involved removing James and his family from the throne and supplanting them with Lady Arabella Stuart, a Catholic contender for the English throne. James, who was keen not to have too bloody a start to his reign, executed the two priests, Watson and Clark but reprieved Cobham, Gray, and Markham while they were at the scaffold. Sir Walter Rawley, who had watched while his colleagues sweated, had been due to be executed a few days later, but was also pardoned. Arabella Stewart denied any knowledge of the plot, and was exonerated. A further blow came in 1604 when Spain signed a peace treaty with England. For a short while, Philip III thought about asking for clauses to be put into the treaty that guaranteed rights for English Catholics. However, rather than antagonize the English and threaten the treaty, Philip decided against this. Henry IV of France, England's closest continental neighbor, was also not in a state to help English Catholics, even if Henry had wanted to. Therefore, English Catholics were very much alone which probably spurred on the 1605 gunpowder conspirators who had come to the conclusion that if no one was going to help them, then they had to help themselves. So, the action moved from London, to the sleepy green vales and country manor houses of the English Midlands, and to the rich agricultural lands of Yorkshire, where a network of pro-Catholic activists was working to support those who maintained, or who had converted, to the old faith. Their work became more urgent when in February 1604, Queen Anne received a rosary from the Pope via one of James's spies, Sir Anthony Standen. The not-too-subtle message was not lost on James, who seeing the threat, promptly denounced the Catholic Church. Three days later, he ordered all Jesuits and all other Catholic priests to leave the country, and reimposed the collection of fines for recusancy, the penalty for not attending Church of England services. Guy Fawkes, the powder expert whose name would become synonymous with the gunpowder plot was born in 1570 in Stonegate, York, three years before Pope Pius excommunicated Queen Elizabeth, so he never knew a time when England was not perceived to be under threat from Catholic Europe. He began life as a Protestant, but converted to Catholicism in his teens under the influence of his stepfather and his school teacher, who was also a prominent York Catholic. At school, Guy was taught along with the sons of Margaret Clitheroe, a butcher's wife from the Shambles, who had also converted. Margaret was first imprisoned in 1577 for refusing to attend Church of England services. But Margaret went further. She became part of the secret network of women and homeowners who created concealed rooms in their houses where Catholic priests could hide. She had such a room in her husband's butcher's shop along with a secret cupboard for the priest's vestments and wine and bread for the mass. However, her secret hiding place did not stay secret for very long. The authorities raided her home in March 1586. And she was arrested. Harboring priests. Had been made a criminal offense punishable by death in an act of parliament of 1581. So the stakes were high. Margaret's trial took place in the Guildhall that year. She refused to be tried by a jury, and so was presumed guilty and automatically sentenced to death. She was taken to the toll booth on Ouse Bridge, where she was pressed under seven or eight hundredweight of stone, until she died. Her ordeal took roughly fifteen minutes, 
and incensed many Catholic dissenters, among whom was a young Guy Fawkes, who attended the same school as her sons. As with all teenagers, no doubt Guy found the transition from teen to adult a tricky path to navigate. But, it must have been harder for him. He had lost his father, changed his religion, and found himself on the wrong side of a society that was fearful and ready to exclude and even kill citizens, who did not conform, like him, his friends, and his family. The plot to kill the king, his family, all the bishops of the Church of England, members of the aristocracy and the entire House of Commons began to come together in May 1604 at a pub known as the Duck and Drake, in the fashionable Strand District of London. The first part involved Thomas Winter travelling to the continent in search of assistance. This is when Winter was introduced to Fawkes, who had been away from England for many years and was relatively unknown in the country. Winter and Fawkes shared the same militant disposition and were both well aware that neither the Spanish nor the French were likely to help them. Antonia Fraser, the author and historian, paints a vivid picture of Guy Fawkes, describing him as a tall, robust man with thick reddish brown hair, a flowing moustache in keeping with the fashion of the time, and a bushy reddish brown beard. The conspirators gained access to a London house owned by John Wynyard, who became the keeper of the king's wardrobe. Fawkes joined him and assumed the role of caretaker adopting the alias John Johnson. A contemporaneous account from Thomas Winter's confession alleged that the conspirators attempted to dig a tunnel from beneath Wynyard's house to Parliament. However, this story might have been a fabrication by the government, as no concrete evidence of the tunnel's existence was presented during the prosecution, and no trace of it has ever been discovered. Fawkes himself only admitted to the existence of such a scheme during his fifth interrogation, but even then, he couldn't provide the tunnel's location. What is certain is that they purchased the lease of a room belonging to John Wynyard close to the House of Lords as their gunpowder store. According to Fawkes, they initially brought in 20 barrels of gunpowder, followed by 16 more, on July the 20th, ready for the state opening of Parliament. However, the opening of Parliament was postponed due to the constant threat of the plague, and it was rescheduled for Tuesday, November 5. When Fawkes inspected the powder store in August, he found it had decayed. So, more gunpowder was brought in along with firewood to conceal it. With everything in place for the biggest explosion in English history, Fawkes's final role in the plot was settled during a series of meetings in October. He was to light the fuse and then escape across the Thames. He would then travel to Europe to explain how they had fulfilled the Pope's wishes. The enormity of the crime Fawkes and his co-conspirators were planning is hard to imagine even today. Envisage the days and weeks after the event. The whole of central London would have been in ruins, and thousands of people would be dead or injured including the royal family, all the lords of the land, the great landowners, the bishops and the knights of the shires. Had Fawkes and his gang succeeded the results would have been catastrophic. Britain would have been leaderless, the social structure would have been decimated and the rule of law would have disappeared perhaps not to reappear for centuries. In a country, that was by then more than 95% Protestant, the backlash against Catholics would have been hideous. The fines for non-compliance with the Protestant state would have been replaced with kangaroo courts and lynch mobs who would have quickly disposed of many innocent Catholics to satisfy their age. Thankfully, someone saw sense. That person may have been a woman called Anne Vaux. Anne was born into a distinguished family of English Catholics, she was 40 at the time of James's accession and had chosen to remain unmarried, dedicating her life to God. Intriguingly, Anne assumed a false identity, posing as the sister of a concealed Catholic Jesuit priest named Father Henry Garnet. Following a pilgrimage to North Wales, a growing unease gnawed at her and she confided her fears in Father Garnet, expressing concern that wild heads have something in hand and imploring him to speak with Robin Catesby the person leading the plot. Anne was not alone in her concerns. Several of the conspirators, and their wives, also expressed worries about the safety of the Catholics who would be present in Parliament, on the day of the planned explosion. Who actually revealed the existence of the plot remains a mystery. 
as knowledge of the event arrived in the form of an anonymous letter to Lord Monteagle on the 26th of October. The letter read, My Lord, out of the love I bear to some of your friends, I have a care of your preservation. Therefore I would advise you, as you tender your life, to devise some excuse to shift your attendance at this Parliament. For God and man hath concurred to punish the wickedness of this time. And think not slightly of this advertisement. But retire yourself into your country where you may expect the event in safety. For though there be no appearance of any stir, yet, I say they shall receive a terrible blow this Parliament. And, yet they shall not see who hurts them. This counsel is not to be condemned because it made you good. And can do you no harm. For the danger is past as soon as you have burnt the letter. And I hope God will give you the grace to make good use of it, to whose holy protection I commend you. Uncertain of the letter's meaning. Monteagle promptly rode to Whitehall and handed it to Robert Cecil. Who was now James's spymaster. News of their potential undoing soon made its way to Catesby, who confronted his co-conspirators with their treachery. But they denied any part of their undoing. And urged him not to abandon the plot. The letter was shown to the king on the 1st of November. Upon reading it, James immediately seized upon the word blow and felt that it hinted at some stratagem of fire and powder, perhaps an explosion exceeding in violence the one that killed his father, Lord Darnley at Kirkerfield in 1567. On Sunday the 3rd of November, Catesby and the others met and decided to go ahead with their plan. Then they separated, each ready to play their part. The first search of the buildings in and around Parliament was made on Monday the 4th of November, by the Duke of Suffolk, Lord Monteagle, and John Wynyard. They found a large pile of firewood in the undercroft beneath the House of Lords, accompanied by Fawkes in the guise of a servant who was looking after his master's firewood. His master, he said, was Thomas Percy, a man already known to the authorities as a Catholic agitator. On hearing what had been found, the king insisted that a more thorough search be undertaken. So, late that night, the search party, headed by Thomas Nivett, returned to the undercroft. They again found Fawkes, but this time not dressed as a humble servant. Fawkes now looked every bit the soldier of fortune he was. He was wearing a warm cloak and an expensive hat. On his feet, he had riding boots with spurs, ready to make his getaway on horse. With their suspicions aroused, Fawkes was arrested. When he was searched, his jailers found him to be in possession of a pocket watch, several slow matches, and a quantity of touchwood, all the things he needed to start the fire that would ignite the thirty-six barrels of gunpowder, the conspirators had stuffed under the House of Lords, along with huge piles of wood and coal to ensure a good blaze. The conspirators were all dead within a few days of their discovery, and Britain was saved from calamity. At the beginning of 1606, Parliament quickly passed an act mandating that November 5 be a day of annual thanksgiving and commemoration of God's intervention to save the king, Parliament and nation. All loyal subjects were to attend services in every Anglican parish. Although there were some surprising voices of religious moderation early on, the sermons at those services were generally exercises in papal bashing and anti-Catholicism. Curiously enough, Guy Fawkes himself was never mentioned in early sermons, and it was the Pope, not Fawkes, who was burned in effigy. So, November 5 became part of a remaking of the calendar of British holidays to suit a new Protestant national identity. It overshadowed the old Catholic holiday of All Saints Day on November 1, and All Souls Day on November 2. It also became part of a history in which the throne and nation were understood as enjoying special protection from divine providence. So, that's why we remember, remember. The 5th of November. Gunpowder, treason and plot. Thanks for listening. And I look forward to seeing you again in my next film. Until then, please do me the favor of pressing the like button, sharing my film on social media, and please subscribe. If you want to see more videos like this where I take a deeper look into some fascinating aspects of history,